run a bit late, and I, I know everyone wants to get to coffee, and I appreciate that. So I'm gonna, I'll go quickly through my little talk. And um, I was asked to address the question, should we use biologics in pregnancy? Uh, I have two parts to this lecture. I'm gonna talk a little bit about the issue of benefits versus risks in medication use. I think sometimes we don't focus on that as quite as much as we should, or at least think about it. And then I'll talk to you about the current status of the IMPACT trial, which is a trial using TNF blockade in patients at high risk for adverse pregnancy outcome, APS patients at high risk for adverse out pregnancy outcome. So should we use biologics in pregnancy? You rheumatologists in the audience know that the answer is yes for many biologics, as long as the benefits are likely to outweigh the risks and the decision making is individualized of a shared nature and includes consideration of pregnancy maternal risks associated with untreated disease. You guys know that. There are two, two uh, individuals for whom we need to consider benefits and risks, and they are the mother and the fetus or newborn, and the child, and the adolescent, and the adult. So the issues at hand are our current understanding of the benefits and risks for many biologics and many other drugs. Uh, is either reasonably secure or not so secure, and there's a large body of unknown factors. For the mother, the benefits uh, of using biologics in pregnancy include the maintenance of disease control, and you rheumatologists know that very well, and the favorable impact of disease control on pregnancy, uh, perhaps by controlling disease to avoid spontaneous preterm birth associated with disease exacerbation, the avoidance of maternal morbidity that might lead to iatrogenic preterm birth. Um, the maternal risks include the risk inherent to infection. And so if a patient is on an immunomodulatory drug and becomes infected, that could be catastrophic for both the mother and the baby. You all know that. Um, I just want to make a, a quick point. Here's a retrospective population-based Danish study um, of pregnancies in patients with Crohn's disease. And the red rectangle is to indicate that the people, the women who had disease control, which is here, with no disease activity during pregnancy, had a lower preterm birth rate. You kind of know this for lupus, I think. You kind of know this for Crohn's disease. You, uh, those in particular, autoimmune conditions, for which disease control has a ben overall beneficial impact on pregnancy outcome. I think most everyone agrees. So the short answer is yes, as long as the benefits are likely to outweigh the risks. You can look at which biologics are considered relatively safe in, in pregnancy and for breastfeeding. Um, you can look to ULAR, and you can look to uh, recent guidelines from the ACR, uh, which have been referenced a couple of times. And th these are very good documents with clear-cut uh, uh, I think clear-cut tables and, and uh, algorithms to help you understand stand these things. Um, I want to talk for a minute about the fetus and newborn. The major concern that gets discussed regarding hydroxychloroquine, prepostatin, you name it, is the issue of malformations caused by agents uh, to which the embryo was exposed during organogenesis. And, and I think you're well aware of this. Here's a partial list of known teratogens. There are quite a number of drugs uh, on this slide that are used by uh, people in this audience uh, relatively routinely. There's lots of complexity to this story, though. For example, lithium, which is widely thought to to be associated with, perhaps causative of, Epstein's anomaly of the heart, causes that anomaly, if it does so, causes that anomaly in a very, very few cases. And so you can think about that when you're deciding to use lithium in, pre in pregnancy. It's a pretty infrequent event. On the other hand, exposure to isoretinoin for Accutane, for acne, the hit rate is 50%, people. You do not want to take that medication in pregnancy. 50% of 
embryos exposed at the wrong moment in time will develop anomalies. So you have to think about it. But here's what I really want to talk about. What about later? What about the newborn, the child, the adolescent, and the adult? And I want us to just think about it a bit because I think it's important. The, take the case of diethyl stilbestrol. This drug was used widely, it's, it's an estrogen compound, used widely in the United States from 1941 through the 60s. I even had a patient or two whose mother took the medication through the early 70s. You know what it was used for? To prevent miscarriage. Does that ring a bell in this audience, in this, to, to anyone in this audience? It was used to prevent miscarriage. And it was based on case series and enthusiasm for the agent. And then finally, Arthur Herbst published an article in the 70s to say, hey, the exposure of the embryo to this medication during pregnancy did not cause structural malformations that you would recognize at birth, but caused adenocarcinoma of the vagina. In 10 to 15,000 women in the United States in their 20s. And I actually took care of two of those patients myself, one of whom died in her 20s of a terrible cancer. Funny thing is, a guy named Diekman, who was an OBGYN doctor working at the Chicago Lying In, published a trial in 1952, a randomized trial to show that it didn't prevent miscarriage. Now here's a more subtle case, that of antenatal steroids. Fluorinated steroids, betamethasone and dexamethasone, are the standard of care in the management of pregnancies at risk for preterm birth. I think you all know this. And the use of antenatal steroids to enhance maturity, particularly pulmonary maturity, in the fetus at risk for preterm birth is arguably the single most important advance in the prevention of preterm birth morbidity and mortality. The most important advance. The Cochrane logo is a forest plot of the prevention of RDS in fetus is at risk for preterm birth. It was recently revised, by the way. Question came to us in the United States, is, does the benefit of antenatal steroids extend beyond 34 weeks gestation? So a trial was done, the ALPS trial. We participated in this, we were one of 14 or 15 centers in the trial. And the composite adverse, the composite primary outcome, which was all about the baby, in that trial, we found a small difference, less than 5% in the composite primary outcome, and that led to widespread adoption of the use of antenatal steroids from 34 to 37 weeks. Most of the difference in the composite, however, was, a, was uh, related to the use of continuous po po positive pressure airway, uh, continuous uh, positive pressure airway support of the child more than 12 hours a short-term outcome that has very little in the way of long-term consequence. So most of the primary outcome difference was based on that. Ah, but in animals, in utero exposure to exogenous corticosteroids may affect fetal brain development and neurologic outcomes. This is actually pretty well established. So some people in Finland thought, we're gonna look at this in a population-based retrospective cohort study using a nationwide, nationwide registries of all the singleton live births in Finland, all the children that survived until one year of age or further. And what they found was that the probability of any mental and behavioral disorder was higher in antenatal steroid uh, exposed infants. And you can see the data out to nine years there. Is this a, an important thing? Well, it, it might be concerning to some parents, maybe to all parents. Our, our professional society now says, you notice it says, strongly recommends, strongly recommends that patients at risk for late preterm delivery be thoroughly counseled regarding the potential risks and the benefits of antenatal cort corticosteroid administration. That's a subtle thing, isn't it? So I think it's complicated. Should any medication, biologic or otherwise, be used in pregnancy? I think the birth defect thing is kind of easy. And I'm going to talk about a TNF drug for which there are hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of exposures and no evidence of teratogenicity. But 
we do need to be thinking a little bit about other issues that are of a long-term nature. I mean, you know, I, that's, what, that's how we ought to be thinking about these things, in my opinion. I'm going to talk about the current status of a trial in which we're using the medication. I think most of you, or many of you, are familiar with this trial. The basis of this trial, Dr. Salmon, Dr. Jane Salmon and I put together, is uh, shown in yellow uh, on this slide. Women that have antiphospholipid syndrome and are lupus anticoagulant positive and or triple positive have a fairly high rate of adverse pregnancy outcome in spite of the standard treatment that people have been talking about. Now, I think you guys know this. And we thought that with, in the PROMISE trial, in, which was a prospective observational study of women recruited at about 12 to 15 weeks gestation, lupus and antiphospholipid patients. In the PROMISE trial, those that were lupus anticoagulant positive had a 44% likelihood of an adverse outcome in spite of standard treatment. That's not a very good treatment. 44% had either a fetal death or severe preeclampsia, placental insufficiency leading to early delivery. And so we thought we, sh we could justify looking at the issues of having an extremely premature baby due to preeclampsia, for example, uh, in a trial where immunomodulation might improve, might improve uh, placentation. So we set out to do this trial, the IMPACT trial, wanting to determine if TNF-alpha blockade, along with standard treatment, during pregnancy reduces the rate of adverse outcomes in uh, APS patients who are lupus anticoagulant positive. Primary outcome is shown there on the slide, fetal death, severe preeclampsia, or placental insufficiency requiring early delivery. It's a rare disease study. This is a complicated thing to do. And so the IRB, the Institutional Review, is in, is in uh, Utah. So all patients are enrolled and consented virtually or in person in Salt Lake City, Utah. <laughs> All patients get a heparin agent and low dose aspirin, and many of the patients are on hydroxychloroquine, especially since the ACR recommendations have been published. All patients get the TNF agent as well, starting at about eight weeks and uh, going out to 28 weeks gestation. You can quibble with me, you can argue with me, but we chose to use a control or comparison group that came from the PROMISE trial, the prospective observational study of patients with whom we did not interfere in any way with treatment, almost all of whom were treated with low molecular weight heparin and aspirin. And we did that because I have a fair amount of experience talking to women who have just lost a 25-week a baby. And the idea that they're going to allow a randomization to a medication that you think theoretically might be beneficial, that, that is not going to fly. So we thought we had a pretty good control group, debatable, debatable, I recognize, but we thought we had a pretty good control group, and this is how we pitched it to the NIH and to the FDA. So here's some preliminary results. We actually now have 40 patients enrolled on our goal, way to 45. <laughs> Um, but here's some results from the first 37 patients you see here. So these, this, the past is gestric history, mean gravidity three. Four patients had recurrent early miscarriage. Um, two of those patients presented with lupus and recurrent early miscarriage. One of those patients had uh, er, recurrent early miscarriage and a, a duplicated uh, uterus and, and two cervices. Uh, one patient had recurrent early miscarriage as well as a fetal death associated with HELP syndrome. Seventy-six percent of the patients that we recruited, have recruited thus far, have a history of fetal death at or beyond 10 weeks gestation. And you'll notice that 60 percent of them have a history of preeclampsia or placental insufficiency in a past pregnancy. In taking a careful history from them, we found that um, some 49 pregnancies in 23 women had been treated because of the, a prior diagnosis with, of APS, had been treated with heparin and low molecular weight, I mean, low molecular weight heparin and aspirin. And uh, the live birth rate historically in the group of treated patients was 24%, not too good. Hence, we're doing the study, don't you see? 
Um, more important to the, to the uh, internist and rheumatologist in the audience, uh, about half of the patients have a history of blood clots. About 20% of them have a history of a CNS event that's fairly serious. About 25% have lupus. Other hematologic conditions, particularly thrombocytopenia, uh, were present in 16%. So here, here, here are the data so far. Um, we've enrolled two patients this week, somehow by luck, so they're not on the slide. Screened 56 people, screened 56 people for a condition uh, that uh, some of us in this room think is pretty common, and I don't think is very common. I mean, Dr. Salmon and I have spoken at the American College of Rheumatology meeting several times. We have talk, spoken at the American Society for Hematology meeting several times. We have spoken at the Society for Maternal Fetal Medicine several times. People call us from around the country. We've gotten, we've, we've, we've screened 56 patients. We've enrolled 39, and 38, 38 of the pregnancies are complete, this thing. I'm sorry, I can't make this work. 38, 38 patients have completed the pregnancy. In this box right here, is, is it me? <laughs> Some have done better. Yeah, I'm going to go over here. <laughs> In this box, right there. You can see that some, some patients discontinued treatment because they had an early miscarriage or an early fetal death, right? And of those four cases, chromosome abnormalities of one sort or the other were present in several. And then those that completed, com completed the study by having a primary outcome are shown in this box right here, right there, right? <laughs> and um, there, were, there were basically, uh, uh, you can see that there were three patients that had a fetal demise as defined in our primary outcome. It's my opinion that two of those fetal deaths had nothing whatsoever to do with antiphospholipid syndrome. That's an opinion. We have to report it as, as shown, right? And I think real outcomes occurred in those bottom patients with severe preeclampsia requiring early delivery for 34 weeks. And you see the timing of delivery th about 30 weeks in those cases. Around I'm sorry, about 32 weeks on average in those cases. And uh, three of those four patients had their only live birth ever. And all the babies are doing well, which we're happy about. So intention to treat, we're at 71% success rate. If you discount the four losses that were uh, shown on the left-hand box, uh, left box there, we're at 79% success rate in this trial. That's what it is. This is hard to do and you know the reasons. Getting, getting lupus anticoagulant tests that you can believe in is really hard. I'm sorry, it's just difficult. So you laboratorians need to help us a bit on that. Getting confirmatory testing is hard. Thus far, we've sent, all, we've sent about half of the samples to uh, Rohan Willis's lab in Galveston for confirmatory testing in a core central lab, and they're all still positive. We get lots of contacts from patients and physicians regarding non-APS cases. So that's, that's a complexity of this. And then in, in recruiting and managing these patients, um, one, person, uh, one person who did not qualify for the study because of uh, a, a platelet count under, under 70,000 um, passed, passed away from a, a, a pulmonary embolism. And another patient passed away after uh, having been diagnosed with previously undiagnosed pulmonary hypertension. And we have a patient who had another pregnancy loss and uh, had very serious uh, 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 psychiatric problems. So it's not an easy group of people to study. Um, one thing to take away from a discussion like this is the assignment of causation, the assignment of cause of fetal death is, com is complicated. You've got to do genetic testing. I've shown you that quite a few cases of fetal losses were chromosomally abnormal. That was brought up by another discussant today. And what is a fetal death at 15 weeks gestation in the absence of 
of anything like a HELP syndrome, which you probably would not expect, in the absence of any pathology showing uh, poor maternal vascularization of the placenta, is that antiphospholipid disease? I think it's a decent question. And I don't have the answer, um, but, but I think uh, Dr. DeJesus will tell us the answer today. <laughs> So I think if you're going to design a trial in these patients, you need to be considering these complexities carefully. And I only wish I could go back and redo the primary outcome just a little bit. So um, there you go. Thank you for, very much for listening. See you. <laughs>